Here's what we're going to do tonight, and it has been a long time since I have been this excited and um, really pumped to approach a subject. We're going to talk about mean Christians tonight. Um, it, well, I mean, I don't know if we should clap. That's kind of mean. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, let's talk about them. Well, that's mean. Um, but seriously, I want, to, uh, I want to address that tonight. And so if you are not a Christian or a faith person, um, that has to be kind of curious for you too because maybe you're like, yeah, like I, I know a few Christians and maybe they're not that nice or I've run into Christians or I see Christians online and most of them are not nice. Um, and so you have your doubts about the ways of Jesus because of the people that claim to follow that way. And they're just mean, um, grouchy, uh, maybe judgmental, uh, rude, um, opinionated. And so I'd like to put on the table tonight what I believe is one of the primary reasons um, we, those of us that claim to follow Jesus, don't look more like Jesus. And one of, my, one of my passions, and it is such an ebb and flow, and it is, I have good days and bad days, a lot of bad days, is I, I want, I want um, my demeanor, I want my words, I want my countenance, I want my um, social interactions, I want my tone to reflect the, the, the kindness, the compassion, the care, the love of Jesus. Um, I don't just want to attend church services and then um, blast my opinions online and marginalize people and make people feel small. Um, we, we that follow Jesus ought to be the most open-armed, open-hearted, loving, listening, caring, considerate group of people on the planet. I wish I could get an amen. I wish I could get an amen. So here's what's going to be counterproductive in the next few minutes. If we just all listen through this filter, I am so glad he's talking about this because I am going to share this or I'm going to think about that mean Christian. Here's what I'd like us all to do tonight, to put our own meanness front and center, to, to put our own rudeness, crudeness, um, ugly behavior towards other people all on the table and let's just ask ourselves a collective question tonight if maybe some of this material relates to us. Um, I have never seen what I'm about to share with you in Scripture until this last week. And I really mean that. I don't mean to sound sensational, although I do like sounding emotional and sensational. But I, I want to take you to a verse we read last week. Uh, the title of, of the sermon tonight is um, When Christians Start Cutting Ears Off when Christians start cutting ears off. And I want to talk about why we are still dealing with mean Christians, why I'm still oftentimes participating as a mean Christian. And I do not believe that's God's design. And I think there are people in here who are like, listen, I would be so down for church. It's just that I've run into so many mean Christians. And a lot of people here tonight or watching right now in Seattle or on the app are like, I don't really know if I can keep doing church at all because of, when I say mean, I mean all like the, you know, the judgmental, the rude, the condescending, the belittling, all of that kind of included in mean Christian. And um, we should just make t-shirts like, I don't want to be a mean Christian. But, um, whoa, Judah, you're so creative. But, um, <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, it's really important to me tonight that we really kind of enter this space as a collective and go, all right, what applies to me, first of all, to me, to me? Because we can all join the fodder online. We can all join the fodder on the streets and be like, yeah, yeah, I hate mean Christians. And if Dr. King taught us anything, you cannot eradicate hate with hate. You cannot eradicate mean with mean. Being mean towards people who are mean is completely not the answer. So we gotta be the difference. We gotta demonstrate the difference. 
and we need a difference. We need an antidote out in these streets, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? All right, go with me to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. When Christians start cutting ears off. Here we go. John 21 and verse 20. John 21 and verse 20. If you have a Bible, great. No worries. If you don't, it'll be up on the screen so you can read along and also so you know I'm not making this up. Peter turned and saw the disciples whom Jesus, whom Jesus loved following him, the one who also leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? And, and, and when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Remember, Peter's in pain. He's going to die a martyr's death. What, I want, you know, what about, what about John? Jesus says this, if it is my will that he remain until I come, comma, what is that to you? You follow me. We talked about that last week. If you kind of want an unpacking of that, that particular portion of scripture and a lot of what this means, you please uh, check out last week's talk. Now look at what verse 23 says. So the saying spread among the brothers that his disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but said, if it is my will that he would remain until I come, what is that to you? So the saying spread, but it was the wrong saying. They, they, amongst Church people, they believed John was not going to die, and yet clearly Jesus never said that John was not going to die. Now, I would like to suggest that the very reason this rumor spread is the very reason we are mean Christians. I'm going to try to explain that. The very reason this rumor spread, again, is the very reason we are mean Christians. It's better if we just do it that way, okay? Some of you are like, I am not a mean Christian, and I do not appreciate being included. Okay, that was actually a mean attitude right there. You see? You did it, okay? So it's just better if we all just kind of own this ourselves, okay? Let's all just put our arms around this and say, okay, I have been mean. For those of, me, and for those of us that are Christian, it's like, okay, I've been, I've been a mean Christian. If you've been a mean Christian once, okay, this applies to you. A lot of you really don't want to accept this. I mean, I can see it on your face. I wish you could see it from my vantage point. You're like, "Uh, no, I'm I'm not in. I'm not in. All right, let's talk about love, you know. That's ironically what we're talking about. Okay, Um, join me in prayer. God, thank you for the moments we share. Uh, I ask that you would take what is really average and ordinary tonight, and you'd make it extraordinary with your participation, and um, we need you. God, I'm praying right now for those here at the Saban Theater. I'm praying for those at every location in Seattle watching. I'm praying for those at any part of the world right now watching on the app. I pray, God, you would experience us. Show us your love. And Lord, for the meanness that any of us struggle with, we want to become more like you. We need more kindness, more consideration, more compassion, and more love. In Jesus' name, and oh God, be with the Seattle Seahawks as we prepare for this NFL season. Please, God, please, please, please. Super Bowls, Super Bowls. Amen. Do you remember going over to a friend's house when you were a kid? You remember that? Remember that you, you, your friend invites you over, maybe right after school, you're like, I can't wait to go over to my friend's house, or maybe it was the weekend and you were having a sleepover, and maybe, uh, I, I, you know, I grew up just, I would literally just go to a friend's house in the neighborhood. Uh, I grew up in a time where my mom, I would come home from school, my mom wouldn't see me till dinner time, right? I'd be out for three, four, five hours. And so I would go over to a friend's house, a lot, but I, I can vividly remember probably around six or seven or eight years old, it started to dawn on me that not everybody did it like the Smiths, right? When you grow up, you think that, you know, whether it was your grandparents who raised you, whether it was a single parent or two parents, you, you think the way you were raised, everybody was raised. And so I remember going over to my buddy, he's still, still my friend, went over to his house, and I won't say his name, um, and my mom said, you can go over to that house for dinner. And I can remember this is probably the first dinner I ever had at a friend's house. We went over to dinner. Now, what I'm expecting is what the Smiths do. And what the Smiths do is we sit down at a table. Uh, there is no kind of television on. There is like a prayer that we pray. Everybody talks about their day. You make eye contact. You are respectful. You look, you, mom, dad, my sister, Wendy, nobody rolls their eyes. Watch your tone. We're having good attitudes. We're Jesus followers, right? Like that was the Smith 
family. I roll over to my buddy's house. He's like, it's dinner time. I'm like, all right. I'm like, dinner time for me. He's like, yeah, let's go. And he's like, no, man, sit back down. I said, on the couch? He said, yeah. Dinner's coming to us. I was like, what? Okay. <laughs> so I, this is no word of a lie. So we sit back, down, sit back down on the couch. We're watching old, old uh, Zorro on Disney Channel. Old Zorro. And I sit back down. We're watching Zorro and Rin Tin Tin. And I'm like, okay. And I cannot believe what I saw next. His mom comes out of the kitchen with a TV tray, <laughs> unfolds it, sets it in front of her eight-year-old son. I mean, I, if I would have known cuss words back then, I would have been cussing. I was so shocked. I was like, what? I'm watching this like I'm watching an alien. This dude is like, he's eight years old. He's like watching Zorro. His mom is setting up a tray. I'm like, oh, this is a trick. We're going to die today. I don't get to do this. I'm sitting in there and I'm like, Mrs. So-and-so, can I help you? No, 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 no. Enjoy your show. Am I in your way? I'm like, what? what? Who's in charge around here? Like, this is, I promise you. Puts up the tray. You're not going to believe. Sets a little cloth over the tray. And I, I'm literally like, okay, all right, this, this is a trick. Starts bringing out uh, his favorite sauces. Mom, I like Heinz 57, please. I'm like, you, so your mom, this is, his, his mom was serving him like a server at a restaurant. And I'm like, and she said, now, boys, I have chicken or steak tonight. I'm like, we have a menu? I promise you. I was like, can I have both? She goes, absolutely, sweetie. I'm like, looking at this guy, and I'm like, I hate my family, man. Like, <laughs> this is unbelievable. It gets better. So we sit down, we just watch Ren Tin Tin and Zorro and Mickey Mouse Club, and, and we're just eating steak, and I'm trying all these different sauces. He's like, Mom, bring out the A1 as well. And I'm like, what world? The ketchup, and I'm like, now I'm ordering stuff, you know? And he's like, you want to go to my room? I was like, yeah, I'd never been to his room. We go to his room, we sit on his bed, I cannot believe. He, he has a TV in his room. Now, you think that's normal. Let me tell you something. If I would have ever snuck a TV in my room, I would not be here today. You think I'm joking. Having a TV in my room growing up, I might as well have a, a young lady in a swimsuit in my bedroom. It was the same thing. My mom was convinced if I had a TV in my room, I would be watching Baywatch. You are not having a TV. He sits down, he's like, what do you want to watch? I'm like, we can watch anything, you know? I'm like, what, what? I remember I, I walked home, it was bedtime, and I was like, all right, man, I'll see you tomorrow. And I think the posture that I walked home with was something that kind of looked like this. <laughs> we got Heinz 57, we got chicken and steak. He's got a TV in this room. To be honest, we watched the Smurfs, and I wasn't allowed to watch Smurfs because they were blue little demons. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> I, could go, I could go further. Care Bears, that's the spirit coming out of their belly. You can't be doing that. Can't be doing that. No. And a couple of those Smurfs, remember, they were, had bad attitudes. And Papa Smurf was satanic, you know? So we watched Smurfs back at that house. So I'm just thinking all stuff and... I get home and I'm like, the Smith family, we got scriptures on the wall. We got one TV. And I'm just like, Mom, hey, she's like, how was your time? I'm like, it was, it was, it was, it was really good. It was, it was different. Uh, we could do things different around here. Um, so then there's like this one time later, I was like, Mom, what if we did TV trays <laughs> and we watched TV while we had dinner? And my dad said, who do you think you are? I will remove you from this planet and make another one. I mean, that's, that was welcome to the Smith family. But I remember how shocked I was to experience a, a different set of rules, a different way of engaging. See, the truth is we all have a normal. We all have a normal. It's not normal, by the way, but we all have a normal. 
and we think it's normal. Now, every once in a while, you run into somebody who's like, that was normal for me, and you're like, oh my gosh, let's hug each other, right? Like, no way, right? No TV in your room, like, no talking during dinner unless spoken to. Like, you know, like, if you ever order with your mom, you would have died. you like, yes, that's amazing, but, but, but all of us have different normals. I want to say it like this. All of us have different ideals, right? And, and, and t- part of how our, our ideals uh, develop is in childhood. We conclude like this is, this is normal, okay? And there's, I would like to suggest there's, this is not exhaustive, but here's three primary ideals. We have uh, cultural ideals that come from, for many of us, maybe raised in this country, maybe raised on the West Coast. Um, and then we have childhood ideals, as I mentioned. And then for those of us that grew up in religious settings, we have church ideas or religious ideals. Now, What we do with those ideals is we take them everywhere we go. We take them everywhere we go. And oftentimes it is subconscious. It is also imperative for us to own the fact that we take these ideals and we take them to the story of God. We take them to the story of Jesus. And without even knowing it, I remember the first time I heard a preacher say, Jesus is not American. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. That don't sound right. Of course he is. In fact, I can tell you exactly what kind of American he is. Yeah, absolutely, because that was my ideal. And I, I, I you know, you're, you're all brilliant and you're laughing and everybody's watching laughing, but, but that, that actually is a young man. I was like, wait, Jesus, Jesus doesn't speak English? I mean, he can, but when he came, he didn't. And I was like, oh, okay. Right, Jesus doesn't know about the Cheesecake Factory. Right? And we immediately go, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, I know that. But we oftentimes hear things that Jesus says, and we hear them through our filter of our normal, our normal. We see words, and we translate them through our ideals. Right? I mentioned this last week. We see the word blessing, And we translate that into our Western cultural ideals. And blessing is oftentimes, if not most of the time in our brain, I'm not saying that we're because we're so selfish and mean and ugly and nasty. It's just normal for us to go blessing, um, success, career, money. And you just need to know that oftentimes the word blessing in the Bible doesn't mean that at all. At all. Right? We, We see all kinds of different words in Scripture, and we assume more specifically, we listen to the teachings of Jesus, and we think we are hearing what he's saying. And here's what happens with these ideals, and we all have them, okay? Ideals are like noses. We all got them, okay? It just is what it is. It's these ideals that we have, and we hear the teachings of Jesus, and I'll say it more specifically. We believe that Jesus holds the same ideals we do, right? Right? We're like, Jesus is so pumped on my career. And like he is, <laughs> but his main objective is not your career. It's your heart. So, so what has been popularized, and I'm not saying anybody's wrong for this, but what has become popularized is we have taken the teachings of Jesus and we have used them to speak to our ideals. That's dangerous. And it leads us much like these ancient believers, to assume Jesus said something he didn't say. And the reason we hear Jesus saying something he's not saying is because we want to hear what we want to hear. When the preacher says blessing, we want to say amen, hallelujah, it's mine. Because our ideal is I want a successful career and I want to appear successful, and when I walk into a room, I want people to be impressed with me. And so we take the teachings of Jesus and make it mean oftentimes just that, but, but, but Jesus, is, Jesus is a person, not just a dead teacher, that all we have left is his words. Please hear me now, and I promise we're going to get somewhere, and it's going, it's, we're going to pick up the pace. We're going to pick up the pace. Somebody like, Judah, we get it. You keep going over this. I got it. We, we have these, these ideals. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Here's the truth. Okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. 
your ideals are supposed to be disrupted frequently by the words of Jesus. They should be. If they're not, and oftentimes I've had extended seasons where they're not, that is when the alarm should go off. Like, if it's been a long period of time, you consider yourself a Jesus worshiper, or a Jesus follower, and you can't remember the last time you were like, oh, shoot, I am so wrong. Whoa, that's not what. Or is the teachings of Jesus always fitting your ideals? Yep, that's the way I was raised. Yep, that's the way it is in this country. Yep, that's, that's how the church is. When's the last time you were like, oh, man, I'm, I'm so wrong about that? That's, that's wild. I am so off about that. It's supposed to be disruptive. So, so Jesus says to Peter, um, what if I want John to live forever? What if I want John to live until I return? What is that to you? You follow me. Now listen, even in ancient time, living forever was cool. Okay, living forever was like, what? What? Right? And so we wanted to hear, these early Jesus followers wanted to hear, right? It was cool. It was sensational. It was like, yo, did you hear about John? He's not going to die. In fact, Jesus is going to return before John passes. He's never going to pass away. And all of a sudden, a rumor, a teaching about a disciple spreads rapidly amongst the believers. Why? Because that's what they wanted to hear. That's what they wanted to hear. And in some cases, that's what they feel they're supposed to hear. Oh, okay, okay. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what it means. That's what it means. You know, sometimes we can be collectively wrong too. Sometimes we can, be, we can all agree on something and be like, no, that's not, that's not right. So the writer of the Gospel of John, now here's what, here's what happened historically. The timeline is not perfect, but if you do some research, you'll, you'll discover something, this story. This story actually happened. John is one of the 12 disciples that followed Jesus for three and a half, approximately three and a half years. John is the youngest disciple from best we can tell, okay? John was like the baby amongst the 12. He's kinda, he relates to Jesus so much like his son. He leaned up against him at the Last Supper, who's gonna betray you? Like John is like the lovable, like artistic, like creative, all heart, like, oh. You know, and he writes that way, right? It's John, right? It's John. Here's what happens. All the disciples are dead. Approximately at the conclusion of this, of this gospel, this letter, all the disciples are dead except John. John has started a church in Ephesus. It goes okay. This church in Ephesus is now watching and then hearing rumors, John's getting old. And now the church is getting scared. John's getting old. And they're like, wait, he's not, he's not supposed to die. He looks, he looks like he's going to die. What's, what's going to happen? And from best we can tell, this rumor was still very strong amongst the church in Ephesus that John had started. It gets worse. Jesus never said what they claimed he had said and spread that he had said. John dies, and the church is in shock. And we have record that some of the church members concluded John did something wrong. That's what it was. John did something wrong. Hear me now. Here's one of the indicators of an unhealthy approach. We, and we still do this in the church, one moment a spiritual leader is a hero. And when things do not deliver the way we wanted them to be delivered and what we believe the scripture teaches, we demonize the same spiritual leader that we used to make a hero. And we do this, my, my brothers and sisters, I got friends who used to stand on platforms and Christians won't even talk to them anymore. They go from hero to that wasn't what was supposed to happen. And now the, 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 the rumor we can read in historically is that some of the believers in Ephesus were like, John, 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 John did something wrong. That's why he died. See, there was something wrong in John, and that's why he died. And suddenly, please hear me, the church went into a tailspin because Jesus said he was going to live forever. 
One scholar believes that the writing of John, that actually John's writings were all put together after his passing. He wrote it all down, and after his passing, it was compiled. One scholar believes that the parentheses that we read, that Jesus actually didn't say that, was actually inserted by the compiler because there was so much despair and distraught believers in Ephesus because they knew what Jesus said. John was wrong. He's a bad guy, and that's why he died and where's God now? Whoa. And here's here's what's happened. We take our ideals, we take our ideals, we superimpose them on the teachings of Jesus, and then when things do not happen according to what we claim Jesus said, despair sets in in communities. People get disillusioned. And wait for it, Christians get mean. Christians get mean. And it gets all the way back. I'm just assuming you're quiet because you're thinking about it. You go all the way back to you heard through your ideal, not through his. So you heard, well, what if I want him to live forever? You heard he's going to live forever. Because who doesn't want to live forever? Young? You know, who doesn't want to live forever? I'll take you to another story Um, in Luke's, Luke's gospel in chapter 22. Listen to this. Words of Jesus, teachings of Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said, all right, things have changed. Now let the one who has a money bag take it. And likewise, a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Jesus' words. For I tell you, the scripture must be fulfilled, and he was numbered for the transgressor, for the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Watch this. And they said, Lord, what they pick up on. We got two swords. Jesus says, it is enough. When he says, it is enough, he clearly does not mean that two swords are enough to defend 12 guys. In what world are two swords enough? He says, it is enough. Now, They heard swords, and their ideal concludes Jesus means it is time to get weapons, right? This is wild. Now, fast forward just a few more verses, a change of scene, and somebody actually uses one of these weapons. It says, while he was still speaking, verse verse 47, there came a crowd, the man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around saw him that would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Shall we strike with the sword? (laughs) These are the same guys who walked actual streets with Jesus for three and a half years. Can I ask you a question? Has there ever been an inkling while walking with Jesus that there was going to come a time he was going to want these guys to start slicing and dicing people with swords? Has, there, has, has Jesus even remotely come close to that? Hey, anybody got a knife? Just keep it on you. You never know. Like, <laughs> but they, listen, they've been walking with him for three and a half years. The moment he says sword, they go, I know what that means. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. And you know why? Because we know categorically many, if not most of the disciples, were very hung up on Israel overtaking Rome, literally, literally. We know that in Acts chapter one, Jesus is resurrected, and in his resurrection form, the disciples are like, is is this the time? Are we gonna take down Rome? Let's go, and he's like, no, I gotta go, and they're like, what? (laughs) Wait, come back, we're not ready. (laughs) So we know they're in that mind. That's their ideal. By the way, that's their childhood ideal. That's their synagogue ideal. That's their cultural ideal. Someday, Israel is going to take over Rome. And Jesus represents whose ideal? His? No, theirs. Jesus says, sword. They go, sword! Trigger word, buzzword, let's go! They go, we got two on us. I mean, by the way, where did those swords come from? Jesus, we have been waiting for this. I got two. And he goes, it's enough. A scene or two later, 
Peter pulls out a sword and cuts an ear off. Now, we got Christians cutting people's ears off. Why? Well, that's, that's what Jesus said. What? We got, we, we got Christians hurt, hurting people in the world. Historically, I, I love friends who tell me like, hey, man, I'm cool that you're a pastor and everything. I'm not really down with Jesus, Christianity, all that, because so much pain, war, abuse, control, slavery has been done in the name of Jesus. And I go, good on you for understanding our history. And I, I don't blame you for that. But just give me a shot to tell you a, a redemptive story and what we're attempting to do in these streets. All of it. There has been whole nations and people groups, oppression, murder, horrific things done in the name of Jesus. This isn't new. This isn't new. Mean Christians, not, not a new thing. Not a new thing. There's been whole mean Christian empires because sword means grab your sword and start cutting people. Let me ask you, does that look anything like Jesus, the Jesus you read about in the four Gospels? at all. Is there ever a moment you're like, yeah. No, Jesus is not hurting people. Jesus is, so when he says sword, does he mean literal sword? Or does he mean a fight's brewing, a war's about to break out, and we immediately think it's natural. We immediately think it's physical, and we immediately want to do what we've been dreaming to do. And Jesus, this guy cuts his ear off, and the plan doesn't go like the disciples thought at all. Jesus picks up the ear of his, their arch enemy, and he puts it back on his ear, on his head. And Jesus is like, put that away, Peter. And he's like, a couple verses ago, you said, go sell our jackets and get more. But you said sword, right? You said, I heard sword. What do you mean when you say sword? Not what you mean when you say sword. Well, how am I supposed to know that? I hear blessing and I think bank account. God's like, I, I don't. Uh oh, well, is bank account like in the list? So here's what happens. We hear words, we hear teachings. It sets our expectations through our ideals and God doesn't deliver. That's what I did on the golf course today. I kicked my driver. That's a true story. Don't you judge me, you mean Christian. But how you doing? Struggling. Why? Because God's word says, and look at my life. Oh, and Jesus says, doesn't he? Yeah. Do you think he means what we think he means? Yeah, of course. He's American. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course he does. Jesus says he knows we need like houses and stuff and, and, and like great bodies and good jobs and things. And that's what I get concerned. I actually think we got a lot of mean Christians because a lot of Christians are hurting because they are reading the teachings of Jesus through their ideals and setting expectations that newsflash may never and most likely will not be fulfilled. And so you're like, remember what happened to Peter after Jesus said, put your sword away? Peter was like, I'm out. I'm exhausted. You, you did not fulfill my ideal. I'm going back to my old job. That's called normal. That's the trajectory of mean Christians. I'm done with the church. I'm done with the church. I'm done with it. It doesn't work for me. Okay. Here's, here's the crux of my message. Here's my, this is the climactic conclusion. We are running a grave risk right now in Christian communities in this country. We are separating the teachings of Jesus from the person of Jesus. And as a result, there is no way we are going to get his story right. We have removed 
Please hear me. The teachings point to the person. The teachings are not an end in themselves. Please hear me now. When all you know is the teachings and you don't know the person, you'll run it through your ideals and you'll end up being disillusioned and you will become a mean Christian. What? Thanks. Thanks for clapping. I know it doesn't feel good, but it's going to end good. It's going to end good. It's going to... It's going to end good. So we have to, um, it's a lot, isn't it? We have to, well, we have to know Jesus. If we don't know Jesus, but we adhere to his teachings, we might use them to abuse people. Because see, do you see the disconnect? The disciples, had they considered the three and a half year lifestyle of Jesus, how he ate, how he walked, how he talked, his schedule, his patterns, his demeanor, his countenance, they would have taken the word sword and put it up to the person and said, body of work, sword must mean something different. Body of work, blessing must need, mean something different. Body of work, living forever till I come. I, that could mean something. Okay, all right, all right, I'm going to tell you the truth. Jesus' teachings have more meaning. They have so many multiple meanings you and I are doomed to think that we can exhaust the teachings of Jesus. That's what it means. What? You, I'll, I'll send you the scholars who say, well, I think it means this. I'll send you the other scholars who say, well, I think it means this. It could be they're all right or all wrong. So then here's my question. Why are the teachings of Jesus so cloaked? I had this question for years. I mean, Jesus is always, he's talking in metaphor. He's like, hey, last time I sent you out, I said, don't take nothing. Just get out there and love people. Now I say, get, 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 get a money bag. Trade your, trade your parkas in for swords. It's, it's, it's on. And the guys are like, wow, it's, he's turning the corner. Here we go. <laughs> right? I mean, all, all, the, all the parables Jesus uses, Right? Harder for a rich man into the kingdom of heaven. The eye of a needle, and eye of a needle was an actual gate in the city, and they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, I got, I got preachers who've told me like, hey, you shouldn't, shouldn't preach on the parables because they're too, they're, too hard to, they're too hard to interpret. And I'm like, ah, we should probably have a go, but like, what? <laughs> what? So why? Why did he cloak it? Why did he say sword when he, he knows that we don't always think about sword the way he thinks about sword and when he means sword? and how, What's the point? Can I tell you what I think the point is? That you can't take his teachings away from his person. He made it in such a way that you got to go, hey, Jesus, I read it. I really did. I read it. I read it. You're a great writer. Um... I had a few questions, though, for real, like Book of Revelation. What? You know, like, uh, can I get some help? Oh, you, you want me to teach you about me? Yeah. Yeah. This book is about a person. It's not the end. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you read the Bible and you think your Bible knowledge is the end. He said, it points to me, and that's where you have erred. So we have so taken the teachings, we have forgot that you got to know him, or without knowing him and merely having his teachings, I am convinced you're going to be a part of the mean Christian army. Because you're going to be like, well, that's not what the word says. That's not what the word says. And we got people quoting Jesus. 
with a tone he never used. What is that? Well, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. So you better turn. What? What's that? That's the teachings of Jesus. <laughs> Sounds like you're yelling at me. I am. You need to repent. You're confusing me. Why? Because I, I heard Jesus was like a really nice guy. Way more than nice, he was, had this deep love for humanity. And you're taking his words and you're using them and I'm feeling a lot of meanness. Do you know him? So Peter, why do Christians cut ears off? They don't know him. And they keep make Jesus, you need to live by my ideals. And Jesus is a lot of wonderful, amazing things. But one thing he's not, he is not made in your image. You are made in his image. That's the order, right? Right? Like, so Jesus has, remember that scripture in Isaiah, and I'm taking a little out of context, but he says, oh, my ways are higher than your ideals. My thoughts are higher than your childhood normal traditions. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew's gospel? He says, you have taken God's story and you have voided it out with your man-made ideals or traditions. And now you are using my story to inflict pain on people. Don't be mean, Pharisees. Don't be mean, Sadducees. All right, all right, all right. So have you had this thought already? I bet you have. Here's the thought I had. Well, if Peter is cutting ears off, and he got three and a half years with physical, visible Jesus, I'm doomed, right? I don't know why I'm standing like this. Like, what am I, what am I, a soccer coach? Like, <laughs> how cool is this stance? Hey, boys and girls, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But, <laughs> hey, so, you know, like, you start, you start, like, posing. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I distract myself, but... Can I, can I take you to a scripture and I end? I will do Acts chapter one, guys, if that's okay. Acts chapter one, and I'm, I'm, ending, I'm ending right here. Um, so when they had come together, this is the resurrected Jesus, and there he's about ready to levitate and disappear. Here, listen to what they said. Lord, is it time? Are you gonna restore the kingdom of Israel? This most likely means, are, is Israel gonna take over Rome? Are we gonna do it? Is it time? That's our ideal. He says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. The Father has fixed by his own authority. And he says this, please hear me. You're coming into a new era, Jesus says. That's what he, that's what he means. And it's going to be defined by my spirit. Not my physical, visible form, but my spirit form. And it's going to give you a power. Dunamis is the word. It's dynamic, power. And the Spirit's going to come upon you, and he's going to live in you. I am going to come upon you and live in you in spirit form, not just walk with you in physical form. And what's going to happen to you is you are going to be able to tell my story accurately to places like Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The Spirit, my Spirit, is going to teach you what I mean when I say what I say. My Spirit is going to filter through your ideals. It's going to, I should say, disrupt your ideals. And this spirit, my spirit, is going to help you know me. Not just my words, but me. For my words lead me, lead you to me. So now, Jesus says, it's better that I go, for when I go, the helper will come, which is to say my spirit form will come, and the spirit will be upon you and in you. And now we have what Peter did not have. 
We have the spirit form of Jesus in us and upon us saying, this is who I am. You want to know me? I'm here. I'm with you. I'll give you dreams. I'll wake you up in the morning. I'll speak to you in the midnight hour. I'll walk with you to the water cooler. I'll give you hints. I'll give you a sense of my love. You'll feel me at times. I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to keep you in accuracy as opposed to, but see, we have to know that this is available, right? That his spirit form now is with us and upon us. And so now, um, don't sell yourself short. Don't sell yourself short. When you read this, read it with him. When you listen to this, listen with him. Don't overwhelm yourself. If some of you can't, if you like, I, I read too much, my mind is jumbled. Don't do that. Read a verse, read a line, read it, and let, let, let the spirit form of Jesus start prompting you. Say things. Now, now some of your friends who are here are like, okay, it is getting a little creepy. I don't like being Christians, but y'all are weird, you know. But like in the morning, at night, whenever you're having a moment thinking about scripture and say, Jesus, I need to know what that means. I don't have time to go into all the scripture references, but the, Jesus said, the spirit's going to come and he's going to glorify me. The word glorify means he's going to show you the essence of who Jesus is. You always know the spirit is working in your life when you become more and more aware of Jesus. More aware of Jesus. So I want you to think, if you were walking with the 12 disciples and Jesus said something, this happened oftentimes, someone would get up the courage in the group to go, Jesus, what does that mean? And oftentimes his response would make it even more cloaked. And the point was, stay close. Watch, work with me, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Now, what I said and what I do, do they seem inconsistent? Then maybe you're filtering it through your ideal and not mine. What would I mean when I said sword? What would I mean when I said there's a battle coming? What would I mean, but maybe there's going to be a spiritual war? For my weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Jesus, you don't want us to fight with people physically. You want us to understand there's a war in the unseen realm spiritually, and we're going to need each other, and we're going to have to trust each other, and we're going to have to learn to talk to you because it is an all-out war. The only way we're going to get nice, and nice is such a cheap word, but, you know, let's at least start on that level. Just, can we just, is it, is it, is it too elementary to say, I, I just want to be one of those community leaders who's like, I'm just looking for some nice Christians these days. How's that? Who just play nice with each other and are nice to people that don't care about Jesus or know Jesus. I'm looking for like, courteous Christians. Anybody with me? Like, it just, it'd be nice just Christians who say, please, thank you. How are you? What's your name? Like, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Christians who are on Twitter are like, hey, let's not talk on this forum. Let's meet up for coffee. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, scratch that. I'm looking for pastors who don't post arguments with other pastors publicly. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. We got pastors publicly arguing their doctrines in front of the world when people are out on these streets dying? Who has time for this? I'm just asking pastors everywhere, and maybe pastors stopped listening to me a long time ago, but I'm like, can we, we got to get this together. We got a tone that Jesus never carried. And we fighting each other in public. I'm looking for pastors who play nice with other pastors. Pastors who walk with Jesus and so they understand that his words go with his demeanor and they go with his tone and they go with his body of work and they go with his lifestyle and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta filter it through that. Right? Can our tone change? Now, if you're not a Christian here, you should be saying amen. Let these Christians know. Can our, I'm done. I, I, need, I, need, I need to stop. I'm in these boot cut jeans, but I'm gonna stop, okay? <laughs> I'm 40. I'm getting more honest. We, we got it. We, we, we got to. 
God help us. I got to be careful. I'm going to end being mean to pastors when I'm talking about mean Christians. So it's like, all right, Judah, you, you about to totally self-destruct right here in the end of your sermon. So, but um, I think, uh, you know, man, I, I, think, uh, I think people are hurting so bad. They're hoping to run in to some people that look like Jesus. And I think we got a shot. I think we got a shot. Christians overwhelmed the Roman Empire with their love. And the Roman Empire became a Jesus-following empire in less than 200 years. Because we just kept being loving. We weren't mean. I think we got whole cities that are broken and hurting, feel empty, feel like they tried everything. And are we living by the same ideals? Or we're living by Jesus' ideals. Wanting to walk in his footsteps. I think I've said enough tonight, but I feel passionate about this. Can I, can I pray for us? Can I pray for me? <laughs> we, we need this. Jesus, <clears throat> I never, I've never seen anybody like you. I never met anybody like you. Nobody. Nobody even comes close and I just want to say I'm really sorry for extended seasons in my life where I made you in my image and didn't let you continue to change me into yours. We, um, we don't want to be a church that lives through our own ideals. And here's your teaching through our own ideals. We want your ideals. So we're going to have to be around you, going to have to listen to you, going to have to feel you. So we want that. Um, and God, I'm going to pray this crazy prayer for any of us that are willing today. God, we're just going to one more time just let you know that everything in our life is subject to your correction and your change. Disrupt every thought, perspective, worldview that I hold that you don't. Disrupt it. We want to become kinder, sweeter, more loving, more passionate, more resolute to walk these streets like you. That's what we want. That's what we want. If you're here today and you say, Judah, I would like to become a follower of Jesus. All that is required is acceptance. All that is required is receptivity. And um, to accept what? Well, the person of Jesus and the gift that he offers. And what he offers is himself. And what he offers is total and complete forgiveness for the error, the wrong, and the sin that each of us have committed. If you'd like that free gift of forgiveness and begin your journey with Jesus, I'm going to welcome you to do that right here, right now. Wherever you are watching in Seattle, wherever you are watching on the app, you're right here at the Savant Theater. If you'd like to make this decision to receive the forgiveness of Jesus and begin following him on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. One, two, three. If that's you, just shoot your hand up all over the auditorium. Thank you. Thank you. For those raising their hands in Seattle, for those raising their hand, maybe even just watching this on a phone, thank you. You are forgiven now forever. And Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, in this moment of reflection, in this moment of worship, I pray that we would feel you. I pray that the spirit form of Jesus would begin to change us, bring us close to you, speak to us, prompt us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. Um, to be honest, it, it really means a lot. It's kind of overwhelming to consider that you take time out of your life to listen to us tell the story of Jesus. If you haven't already, you can subscribe right here to the channel and get more of God's incredible love for you and his story of grace. Again, I can't say it enough. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, hopefully we can do this again real soon.